Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Katie, and the egret in the chair next to me is Ellen. You're gonna egret that. Uh, I already do. Then let's just keep rolling into the rolling rehash. Last week we covered Chapter 4, Back to the Burrow, and Chapter 5, Weasley's Wizard Wheezes, because there were no corresponding film scenes yet again negating the entire purpose of this podcast. Vernon's opinion of wizarding folk did not improve when covered in debris from his blasted-out fireplace. Dudley was really feeling himself, but maybe shouldn't have let his guard down and cheated on his diet, causing Petunia to become a literal tongue twister. Arthur tried his best to be cordial to the satchels of assholes, but let's face it, deep down, he really enjoyed blowing their shit up. Bill and Charlie became everyone's favorite Weasleys, except for the movie watchers who can't quite place a face with the name. Molly once again proves to be a master of multitasking by simultaneously kicking ass in the kitchen and taking names, also in the kitchen. Percy's fat bottom cauldrons made the wizard world go round. Harry hopes the Quidditch World Cup goes on for five days because he's crazy. And we owe David Yates an apology. For now. Yeah. We may have mixed up directors last episode <laughs> yeah <laughs> david yates should not have been blamed for movie for four. goblet of fire not for goblet of fire yes there's plenty to blame him for but none of that is goblet of fire mike newell actually directed goblet of fire which for some reason skipped our minds so all that stuff that i said about david yates Go ahead and just put your name in there because it all is directed at you, Mike Newell. Yeah, so if you listen to episode 66 and you heard us say the director incorrectly, just next time you listen to it, if you listen to it again, imagine <laughs> Mike Newell's name in place. We were cursing him, not David Yates. Yes. So far. Right. I just remembered that he did the last four movies and I was just like four, five, six, seven, forgetting about eight, so... Yeah. My bad. It was actually five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> five, six, five, six, seven, eight. Damn you, David Yates. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Damn you, Mike Newell. Yes. We have plenty of time to get to that. <laughs> yes. In the meantime, during episode 66, oh my stars, our Potter pondering was since chapters four and five were not present in the movie at all, we were wondering if there was anything about them in specific that you wish had been included. Quincy said, so there could have been a scene where Harry mentioned the Weasleys were coming sooner than expected. Giggity. <laughs> he would have even been okay if they would have streamlined it and had them show up that night. How amazing would it have been if they would have had the fireplace shooting across the room and Fred and George terrorizing Dudley. Don't even get him started on the shameful scene that they tried to pass off as the Quidditch World Cup. The Lord of the Rings movies were three to four hours each and made more than double their budget back. He thinks that it's a bit insulting to think that the Harry Potter fan base would enjoy more Harry Potter if the movies were beautifully made. Goblet of Fire is such a strange movie because of the creative direction they took. Like, why does it seem that all of the characters are so angry or aggressive? And that is added on to by the way the movie just jumps around and has no cohesion. Short story long, the movie sucked, read the books. He says he'll even let you sign into his Audible if you want to listen to the audiobooks. Dave said he would have loved to see the Weasleys stuck in a blocked fireplace and the movie's interpretation of Bill. He said hopefully they wouldn't have made him look like Chris Angel. <laughs> Definitely. I have to agree there. Yeah. <laughs> Max said, Pigwidgeon. He just wants to see Hedwig's boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Mike said, LOL, everything? <laughs> As an adult thinking about the ton tongue toffee, he can't help but be like, that sounds super dangerous. But for the most part, they were less dangerous while maintaining hilarity. He says he's a big fan of the canary pastries or whatever they were called. Canary creams. Mm -hmm. Those are great since the effects are only temporary. Right. I bet they learned from the Tun Tung Toffee incident. 
Carly said, Gah, they leave out so much. Introducing Bill and Charlie, showing what an uptight ass Percy is, Pigwidgeon, Ron's room, better than it's shown, Ginny. Yeah, and then Juliana echoed what we've been saying about Ginny all along. Book Ginny is a badass. The more she rereads the books, the more she loves Ginny. The scriptwriters did not do her character justice. She also said that she would have loved seeing the Tun Tung Toffee scene. Bill and Charlie could have easily been introduced in this as well. Then, when Charlie comes back later in the book before the first task, it would make more sense. And Bill meeting Fleur would make her reappearance in Half-Blood Prince less shocking. Jackson said he'd like to see the exploding fireplace, the Tung Tung Toffee, and actually having Charlie and Bill in the film. Who? Yeah, Charlie and Bill. Bill, I've heard of Charlie. Charlie? You know his name. You, you wouldn't know his face, though. Oh, you mean Ed Sheeran? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yes, yes. <laughs> Someone on Reddit said that it wasn't a bad decision to leave those moments out, which I kind of disagree with. Yeah. But they said that the movie is long enough and those few chapters aren't necessary to the plot, which, okay, yeah. you're not wrong. <laughs> Technically. But that being said... The pacing of the film is so terrible anyways that they would rather see Dudley eat the Tun Tung toffee than Harry, Ron, and Hermione bitch at each other for another half hour. Which is fair. Though we've never shied away from saying we'd still watch Harry Potter, even if it was five hours long. Yeah, they also said that they'd love to see a TV series one day, which would definitely be awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for all of your responses. Good ones this week. Yeah, we had some really good ones. Our trivia question last week was, how long did Fred and George spend developing the Tun Tung Toffees? As they are leaving for the Quidditch World Cup, Mrs. Weasley realizes they are trying to sneak the Tung Tung Toffees with them, hidden all over their bodies. She uses Akio to summon them all from their hiding places, causing Fred to shout that they spent six months developing them! Congratulations goes to Mike Riley. He just edged out Dave for the win even though they both posted in the completely wrong place. <laughs> yeah, they posted on the episode post, not the trivia post. Actually, I can see how that can get a bit confusing, so I think from now on we're just going to have people post on the official episode post that Podbean puts on Facebook instead of having two separate posts. Yeah, we can just use the episode post as the general gathering place for the trivia answer and any questions or discussion our keepers might want to have about the episode. I like it. It'll stop Mike from trying to say he can't tell the posts apart. <laughs> he tried to claim they were identical. I told him fraternal at best because one specifically says it's the trivia post. <laughs> he wasn't the only one who got confused, though. Like you said, Dave posted on the wrong post, too. And Max tried to answer as just keep rolling again, <laughs> though he was at least actually on the trivia post. <laughs> it was an action-packed evening for the trivia question. Mm -hmm. Hopefully this week is just as entertaining. Yep. But for now... Let's just keep rolling into chapter six, the port key, and finally, some corresponding film scenes. Chapter six, the port key. Harry feels like he had barely been asleep when Mrs. Weasley is shaking him awake before moving on to wake up Ron, then Fred and George. Feeling very groggy, they all dress in silence and head down to the kitchen. Mrs. Weasley is stirring a large pot at the stove, and Mr. Weasley, who is wearing a golfing sweater and very old jeans, is checking through the tickets. When the boys walk in, he looks up and asks Harry if he looks like a muggle. Harry says he does, and George yawns while asking where Bill, Charlie, and Percy are. Mrs. Weasley says they can sleep in some since they can all apparate. A very grumpy Fred wishes they could apparate too, and his mom reminds him that they aren't of age, and haven't passed the test, before going off to check on Ginny and Hermione. Harry asks about the apparition test, and Mr. Weasley explains that apparition isn't easy and can sometimes go wrong, like with the people who splinched themselves. Everyone winces except Harry, who has to ask what splinching is. Mr. Weasley tells him that they left half of themselves behind and were stuck until the accidental magic reversal squad sorted them out. It meant a fair bit of paperwork, especially since Muggles spotted the body parts left behind. This makes Harry imagine a pair of legs and an eyeball lying abandoned at Privet Drive, and he wonders if they were okay. They were, though they got a heavy fine and probably won't try it again anytime soon. It's not something to mess around with, and even a lot of adult wizards prefer brooms. 
They continue talking about Bill, Charlie, and Percy taking the test and are then joined by Hermione and Ginny, who is also wondering why they have to be up so early. Mr. Weasley says they have a bit of a walk, and as he explains the difficulty of organizing the gathering of large groups of wizards without attracting muggle attention, Mrs. Weasley yells at George, demanding to know what's in his pocket. George innocently says nothing, but his mother doesn't believe him and she starts pointing her wand at his pockets, repeatedly saying Axio, and causing all of the ton-tongue toffees that the twins were trying to smuggle out of the house to go flying out of various hiding places in their clothes. Fred shouts that they spent six months developing those, and Mrs. Weasley shrieks back that it's no wonder they didn't get more OWLs. This left for a very tense departure, as both Mrs. Weasley and the twins are glowering. Fred and George walk away without saying anything to their mom, and she says for everyone to have a lovely time, but yells behave yourself at the twins' backs. It's still dark out, and Harry speeds up to walk by Mr. Weasley so he can ask more about how they organize the event without Muggles noticing. It's a logistical nightmare that involves finding a location big enough that can be set up with anti-Muggle precautions. Then they have to stagger arrivals starting weeks in advance. Some use Muggle transport, some apparate, and the rest use port keys at a prearranged time. 200 port keys have been placed strategically around Britain, and they are headed to the nearest one at the top of Stoats Head Hill. Harry wants to know what kind of objects are port keys, and learns that they can be anything, and are usually things Muggles would think are just trash so they don't pick them up. They continue walking and begin to climb Stoats Head Hill, which is quite a feat. When they reach the top, Hermione clutching a stitch in her side, they start looking around for the port key. After a couple of minutes, a voice calls out to Arthur, saying that they've got it. Mr. Weasley greets a man, who is holding an old boot, as Amos, and introduces him to everyone else as Amos Diggory, saying he works for the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. He then acknowledges the extremely handsome boy with him as Amos's son Cedric, saying that they already know him from school. Cedric says hi, and everyone says hi back, except Fred and George, who still haven't forgiven him for beating Gryffindor in Quidditch last year. Amos and Arthur talk about their walks and the cost of the tickets. Amos says he got off easy and wonders if all of the kids are Arthur's. Mr. Weasley tells him that his are the redheads and introduces Hermione and Harry as Ron's friends. Mr. Diggory recognizes Harry as Harry Potter and brings up the fact that his son beat Harry Potter in Quidditch. Cedric mutters that Harry fell off his broom and Amos continues to brag about his son, who didn't fall off his broom. Mr. Weasley looks at his watch and changes the subject, saying it must be nearly time. He confirms that they aren't waiting for anyone else and then explains to Harry and Hermione that they just need to touch the port key. The nine of them gather around the boot as Harry thinks about how odd the scene would look to any muggle who happened upon them. Mr. Weasley counts down from three and at one, Harry feels as if a hook jerks him from behind his navel, pulling him forward and off the ground. His finger is stuck to the boot as they speed in a howl of wind and swirling color before slamming into the ground. Harry looks up at Mr. Weasley, Mr. Diggory, and Cedric, who are the only ones still standing, as a voice says, seven past five from Stoats Head Hill. The movie scene picks up with Harry reacting to a nightmare as the whistling tea kettle lingers from the previous scene. As Harry thrashes around, a voice says his name and holds a candle over him. The voice says his name again and Harry awakes with a start and reaches for his glasses as she asks if he is all right. He puts his glasses on, sees Hermione leaning over him, explains that he had a bad dream, and asks her when she got there. She answers, just now, and asks about his arrival. Harry explains that he got there the night before, and Hermione moves to wake up Ron, who is very startled to find Hermione in his bedroom and clutches his blanket to his chest as he exclaims, Bloody hell! Harry touches his scar and winces in pain as Hermione exasperatedly tells them to get dressed and not to go back to sleep. She tells them that Ron's mom said breakfast is ready, leaves the room, and Ron immediately goes back to sleep. The scene cuts to the Weasleys, Harry, and Hermione leaving the burrow pre-dawn as they make their way up a path and through some trees. Harry asks Ron where they are actually going, and Ron says that he doesn't know before asking his dad. Mr. Weasley answers that he hasn't the foggiest and tells them to keep up. They meet up with a man who greets Arthur and tells him that it's about time. 
as Ron yawns, Mr. Weasley explains to Amos that some of them had a sleepy start, and then introduces him to everyone else as Amos Diggory. As he is explaining that he works with him at the ministry, a teenage boy drops out of the tree and lands next to him. Mr. Weasley acknowledges him as Cedric and shakes his hand, as Hermione and Ginny exchange a look about the handsome boy. As the group continues their trek through the woods, Mr. Diggory recognizes Harry as Harry Potter and shakes his hand enthusiastically, telling him that it's a great pleasure. The sun is finally starting to rise as they make their way up a grassy hill and find a lone boot perched at the top. Everyone gathers around, causing Harry to ask why they are all standing around that manky old boot. Fred and George explain that it isn't just any manky old boot, it's a port key. Mr. Weasley announces that it is time to go, and Harry confusedly asks what a port key is. Everyone is down on their hands and knees, surrounding the boot, except for Harry, who is still extremely bewildered by the situation. As Mr. Diggory counts to three, Arthur realizes that Harry isn't touching the boot and anxiously says his name, prompting him to get his hand onto the boot just as Amos says three. The camera switches to an aerial view and begins spiraling as the group are lifted and spun through the air, and then a more abstract transition as they disappear and reappear with some flashing lights. The camera then focuses on their faces as they are flying, and Mr. Weasley encourages the kids to let go. Though Hermione is initially shocked at the idea, they all let go and fall through a magical transport tunnel, with Harry, Ron, Hermione, Ginny, and the Weasley twins hitting the ground hard. They look up and see Mr. Weasley, Mr. Diggory, and Cedric walking through the air and lightly landing on their feet, as Mr. Diggory says he bets that cleared their sinuses. So this time, we actually have corresponding film scenes! Yay, I have something to do! <laughs> <laughs> like you didn't do anything last week I mean, or the I, week before. Yeah. But still. There's obviously details streamed line out and some random details completely changed. But for the most part, this movie stayed relatively similar to the book chapter. Yeah, considering that we haven't even had movie sections for the last four chapters, it's already a huge improvement. Yeah. <laughs> so in the book, it's still dark outside and Harry feels like he's just fallen asleep when Mrs. Weasley comes to wake up Ron, Fred, George and himself. Mm hmm. In the movie, Harry is thrashing around from the nightmare he had back in the first chapter. You know, remember that? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> when he is actually woken up by Hermione rather than Mrs. Weasley. He puts his glasses on and sees her leaning over him with a candle. And for the record, waking someone up like that and hovering a candle like directly over their head... That's a dick move! I would not react well to being woken up like that. That's just That's a dick move. I mean... First off, because the candle, like, you can't see past the candle, so you don't know who the fuck is waking you up. Second off, what if wax drips into your eye or something? Fuck that. That sucks. I just don't like it. I don't like it. I understand why they had to do it for the shot, but I don't like it. So there. Dick move. Dick move. <laughs> but Hermione asks if he is all right, and he explains that it was a bad dream before asking her when she got there. She says just now and asks about his arrival. Harry explains that he got there the night before. This is semi-accurate? Mm-hmm. Since Harry did technically arrive the night before in the book. But it's also wrong. Entirely, Because yes. Hermione had arrived the day before Harry, not super early the morning of. Why would she get there that early? I don't know. Right. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Especially, like, she's a muggle-born. How did she get there that, like... Yeah, did her parents drive her all night to get her there at the butt crack of dawn? Like, that just seems very, I don't know, it's stupid. But like you said before, she isn't the one who wakes them up in the book. But in the movie, she just goes into complete bitch mode. It's clearly the crack of dawn, and who wants to be woken up like that? Rude! You know what else is rude? Hmm? Harry's hair. Oh, God. Harry's hair is a crime against hair follicles. Like, it kills me how bad it is. They should charge him with follicular manslaughter. Oh my god. <laughs> I, I set you up for that, didn't I? Uh -huh. Shit. <laughs> wow. Bump set spike! <laughs> uh, way to go, Maverick. <laughs> Thanks, Goose. Also, I know this is going to come as a complete shock to you, but I don't like Emma's acting in this scene. What? I know. 
I know you're completely surprised because I've been so positive about her up to now. (laughs) Is it her eyebrows or the fact that she's just super bitchy? I mean, she must not be a morning person. Those fucking eyebrows. (laughs) I'm I feel really bad with how harsh I am on Emma, but. She gets better. Does she? We're in the fourth movie and you haven't been nice yet. She d- she gets better. She does. It's just, I just, I'm very critical. I'm also not the biggest book Hermione fan either, though. So it doesn't help. Finish reading Sarah's book. It might change your perspective. I know. I really need to get that started. But while we're on this scene, though, I also don't like how Ron covers himself like he's a fucking scandalized Southern Belle and Hermione is an unexpected man in her chambers. How dare you, sir? Oh, my stars. (laughs) Oh, goodness. A man. I'm scandalized. Yeah, I don't like it. (laughs) (laughs) It's pretty dramatic. Don't like it. Harry touches his scar and winces in pain, which is the only clue we got that Harry's scar hurt after the dream. At least they included it, I guess. Mm, Barely, if at all, but yes. (laughs) There's a bit more bitching from Hermione, which ends in an, and don't go back to sleep. And Ron, predictably, goes back to sleep. What? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Which is not how it happened in the book. What? In the book, they're half awake, but they do get dressed and disheveled and yawning head down to the kitchen. Mrs. Weasley is stirring a pot on the stove, and Mr. Weasley is checking their tickets, dressed in a golf sweater and oversized jeans. He asked Harry if he looks like a muggle since they're supposed to be incognito, and Harry says he looks very good. (laughs) George asks through a yawn where Bill, Charlie, and Percy are, and Mrs. Weasley says they are apparating and can sleep in while she ladles out porridge for them. And apparently Bill, Charlie, and Percy just sleep straight through the entire World Cup because they never show up in the movie. At all. Not even a bit. Who? (laughs) (laughs) Also, we never even get to see Mrs. Weasley. I can't joke about that one. No. A little bummed. Right. A little pissed. Newell. Ah. (laughs) Harry knows that apparating is disappearing from one place and reappearing almost instantly in another place and that it's very difficult. Fred asks why they can't apparate too, and Mrs. Weasley tells them that they aren't of age and haven't passed their test. Harry hadn't known about the test, so he asked about it. I mean, it kind of reminds me of a driver's test. Yeah, I like that parallel there. Yeah. When they're of age, they can take the driver's yeah, test, except can... it's the apparition test. <laughs> except they can, you know, leave half of their body behind if they fuck it up. I mean, do you want to get morbid because... Well, no. We're going <laughs> to... Anyway, let's keep on rolling. rolling. Mr. Weasley tells him that the Department of Magical Transportation had to fine a couple for apparating without a license. It's very difficult and can lead to nasty complications. The couple that he was talking about got splinched. Everybody winces except for Harry, who has to ask what that means. To be fair, that just sounds like a gross word. It sounds bad. Like, I wouldn't... (laughs) Even not knowing what that means, if you see everybody wince, like, it must be bad, obviously. Even not seeing people wince, I'm still like, splinch, that just sounds gross. There's nothing that sounds pleasant about that word. No, not even a little bit. Just in general. And this scene right here is further proof that Book Harry does actually ask questions. Mm -hmm. Although Movie Harry asks more questions too, they just don't get answered. Yeah. (laughs) They're just kind of like, meh, whatever. And Mr. Weasley actually does answer all of Harry's questions. He explains that... Splinching means they left half of themselves behind and they had to wait for the accidental magic reversal squad to come and put them back together. He also included that it was a lot of paperwork because some muggles saw them or at least the parts of them. Awkward. (laughs) Right. And that makes Harry imagine bits of body parts lying around on Privet Drive. (laughs) Just like a leg here and an eyeball there. That wouldn't piss off the Dursleys at all. That's not abnormal in any way, shape, or form. It's Mm. super abnormal. Yeah, that's the idea. But Harry's reaction (laughs) is to ask if they're okay. Sure. He's a nice kid. Sure. He's like, consider it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Weasley says that they are, aside from the heavy fine. And he reiterates again how difficult apparition is. Even tells them that many adult wizards don't even bother with it and prefer the slower, safer method of traveling by brooms. I kind of wonder, maybe this should be our Potter pondering, but what do you think 
our keepers would prefer to travel by because yeah. we got flu powder and port keys and apparition and broomsticks yeah or the night bus there's a number of different ways to travel i wonder but... what the preference would be i don't know what's your preference i think i'd like to be able to apparate mm-hmm. that's kind of me too like because you know flu powder is messy yeah you get all sooty from the fireplaces and everything Broomsticks, I imagine splinters would be a worry. Blisters. Blisters, splinters, just the general uncomfortableness, I would think. Getting cold. Yeah, there's that too. I mean, it would be fun. It would be fun to have that feeling of flying through the air, but I wouldn't want to do it all the time. Yeah. I was like, I really like the idea of having a Vespa, but then I really like my car that has four windows and windows heat and, heat and, and air conditioning in the summer. Exactly. My thing with it is... With apparition, you only have to rely on yourself. You don't have to buy more flu powder. You don't have mm-hmm. to own a broom. You don't have to go hunt out a port key. Yeah. If you learn how to apparate, you can just you can just go. go. Yeah. It just sounds better to me. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I want to know what the keepers think because it's a very interesting question. So I like that for the Potter Pondering. Cool. For sure. Works for me. Anyway, Fred says that Charlie failed his test the first time. And Percy only passed his two weeks ago, and he's been apparating downstairs every day just to show off. I mean, I would too. Oh, yeah. If I'm being honest. That's like when you first get your driver's license, and you're like, I, I need to go somewhere. Can I go somewhere? You're like asking your mom, can I go to the store for you? Do right. Do you need anything for the Do you the want store? me to pick up my little brother? <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to go do something for you? Like, can I go pay a bill or something <laughs> for you? Like, anything. I just want to drive. Yeah. I'm allowed to do it without you in the car now. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> While this conversation is going on, a groggy Hermione and Jenny enter the kitchen, and Jenny asks why they have to be up so early. Mr. Weasley says they have a bit of a walk, and Harry asks if they're walking to the World Cup, which they're not. Yeah. Mr. Weasley explains that it's hard for large groups of wizards to gather without muggles noticing, and they have to be careful about traveling. This is obviously different from how the movie had it since the girls seem to have a harder time getting down to breakfast than the boys did instead of a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed hermione playing bitchy alarm clock (laughs) yeah but as mr weasley is explaining that traveling for the quidditch world cup is extra tricky he's interrupted by mrs weasley shouting at george demanding to know what is in his pockets (laughs) george acts innocent and says nothing Mrs. Weasley tells him not to lie and pulls out her wand and magically summons the handful of Tun Tung toffees from his pocket. Which is yet another moment I wish we could have seen. Oh, for serious. Mm. This makes me angry that we did. Yeah. I'm just angry. So much drama. Mm-hmm. She yells that they were supposed to destroy everything and tells them to empty their pockets. The twins had been trying to smuggle as many of the toffees out as possible, and Mrs. Weasley has to shout Axio repeatedly to find them all. Or Accio. <laughs> or Osseo. <laughs> I know the movies say Accio. Accio. And the audiobook says Osseo. But I always read it as Axio, like accident, with the See, double C. So. Yeah, when you explained that to me a while ago, and I was like, that actually does make sense. It just doesn't have a good mouth feel to me, which is weird. <laughs> but... Well, when you're used to hearing it a certain way, yeah. too. I just, I've been reading it that way for so long that that's what I'm used to. And that's what I say. I think I used to say Akio before the movies came out. And then I heard them say Akio and I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> Similar. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, Fred and George wailed that it had taken them six months to develop the candy. Which was our trivia question. Yep. <laughs> Mrs. Weasley responds by telling them it's no wonder they didn't get more OWLs. And she's still angry when the group departs. She does tell everyone to have a lovely time, and then she adds on for the twins to behave themselves, <laughs> though they don't even look back at her. She tells Mr. Weasley that she will send the others around midday, and he, Ron, Harry, Hermione, and Ginny set off into the dark after the twins. Hmm, let's see. How much of this happened in the movie? Oh, yeah, none of it. <laughs> none of this happened in the movie. What? <laughs> it just cut from Ron going back to sleep to the Weasleys, Harry, and Hermione leaving the burrow, pre-dawn, hiking to the woods. Harry asks Ron where they are actually going, and Ron says that he doesn't know before asking his dad. Where are we going? I don't know. Just keep rolling. Just keep rolling. <laughs> just keep up. <laughs> In the book, we get some of Harry's inner monologue as he imagines thousands of wizards heading for the Quidditch World Cup and catches up to Mr. Weasley so he can keep asking questions Mm -hmm. about how everyone gets there without the muggles noticing. 
Mr. Weasley tells him that organizing the cup was a huge problem between the hundreds of thousands of wizards who attend the World Cup and not having a space large enough to accommodate such a big group. The ministry had to find a deserted moor, set up anti-muggle precautions, and then stagger everyone's arrival, those with cheaper tickets beginning to arrive two weeks ago. Which is just crazy. Can you imagine just That's like, insane. I'm just going to live in this field for two weeks leading up to this game. Like, again, I mean, I know we're not big on sports ball, but I can't imagine <laughs> being like, hey, I'll just camp out for two weeks while I wait for this to happen. No, I just can't. Well, I imagine you could still like live your life. I mean, yeah, somewhat. theoretically. If you mean, if you can just apparate, maybe... Can you just set up the tent and then go back and then travel? Like, but then the whole traveling thing I mean, is the we, issue. So yeah, it was the travel that was the issue. I imagine so. that you just have to take two weeks off work then, plus however long the game actually takes too. Right. Interesting. That's a lot, but that's why you have to get the more expensive seats. I guess that's how yeah, they get you. That's how they get you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they use some Muggle transportation, but it's very limited. Some wizards apparate. And they have a designated apparition point for that. But most wizards travel by port key, which is an object that can transport wizards at a designated time and can be used by many wizards at once. There's about 200 port keys around Britain, and they're walking to the one on the hill beyond the village of Ottery St. Catchpole. Harry asks what kind of objects the port keys are, and Mr. Weasley tells him that they can be anything that the muggles will probably think is litter and just leave alone. But in the movie, they just walk a bit and meet up with a man who greets Arthur and tells him that it's about time. As Ron yawns, Mr. Weasley explains to Amos that some of them had a sleepy start and then introduces him to everyone else as Amos Diggory. In the book, they walk a lot, Mm -hmm. though it's down the lane of a village rather than through the woods. Mr. Weasley keeps checking his watch as they make their way up the side of a hill. Harry's legs start to seize up when he finally reaches the top of the hill, and Mr. Weasley exclaims that they made good time and had ten minutes left to look for the port key. They spread out to look for it, and after a moment, somebody shouts to Arthur that they have it and to come over. And this is where they meet up with Amos Diggory in the book, who's holding an old, moldy-looking boot. Ew. Manky old boot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mr. Weasley introduces him and says he works in the department for the regulation and control of magical creatures. He then says he thinks they know his son, Cedric. Hmm, I wonder if that's going to come up later. Hmm. Hmm. (laughs) It's a bit similar in the movie, except Cedric isn't standing next to his dad. As Mr. Weasley is explaining that Amos works with him at the ministry, a vampire, I mean, a teenage boy, (laughs) drops out of a tree and lands next to him. Mr. Weasley acknowledges him as Cedric and shakes his hand as Hermione and Ginny exchange a look about the handsome boy. Ooh. Ooh. The book actually does describe Cedric as being tall and handsome, so hey. I mean, they're not wrong. It reminds us that he's the captain and seeker for the Hufflepuff House Quidditch team. He says hello to everybody, and everybody except Fred and George say hello back. The twins haven't quite forgiven him for Hufflepuff beating Gryffindor in the first match of the Quidditch season last year. Seeing as how the third movie didn't really include Cedric, they completely did away with the whole Quidditch rivalry thing and just had everybody be best buds with Cedric, because why not? Oh, yeah. They were like, oh, hey, so great to see you. Happy, happy, happy. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Cedric, my man, what's up, guy? They have like a secret handshake. Right, yeah. (laughs) In the book, Mr. Diggory asks how the walk was, and Mr. Weasley says it wasn't too bad since they only live on the other side of the village. He asks how theirs was, and Cedric's father says they had to get up at two, and that he'll be happy when Cedric passes his apparition test. But he isn't complaining because he wouldn't miss the Quidditch World Cup for a sack full of galleons, which is practically what the tickets had cost. Noting that he got off easy since he only had him and Cedric, and Mr. Weasley was hurting a lot of redheads and a couple of strays. (laughs) All with really bad hair. It was really bad hair. (laughs) Ron's hair is pretty bad, too. They're all bad. They're Like, every single head of hair is bad. I'm sorry. It's just... Did you see the twins' hair? Yeah. Like, even Amos Diggory looks like an Oliver Twist reject, for fuck's sake. <laughs> I don't think they're all bad. Well, I, okay. Ginny's hair is nice, and so is Hermione's. But that is also bad, when you think about it, because it's not supposed to be nice. It's not. It's not. Cedric's hair is all right, but you know what? I don't like how Hermione and Ginny make eyes at him. It just feels 
non Hermione. Like I just don't like it. Yeah, we were kind of talking about that with Sarah when we had mm-hmm. her on for the bonus episode. Like Hermione isn't really one to ogle guys like that. Yeah. She's not giggly and it just felt very out of character for her. I don't think it's very Ginny like either because she's supposed to be making eyes at Harry. I mean you got more than one eye. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I love my husband. I ogle him plenty, but Cedric walks by him. I ogle at Cedric. Fair enough. In the book, Mr. Weasley introduces everyone, and Mr. Diggory asks Harry Potter? Harry says yeah and is uncomfortable, as always, as Mr. Diggory's eyes move immediately to the lightning bolt scar on his forehead. Amos Diggory says that his son has talked about him before, and he told him that beating Harry Potter in a Quidditch match could be a story for the grandchildren. (laughs) Harry doesn't know what to say and stays quiet. Fred and George are scowling again, and Cedric looks embarrassed. He tries to tell his father that Harry had fallen off his broom, and Mr. Diggory laughs and says that he didn't fall off his broom. It doesn't take a genius to know that the better flyer is the one who doesn't fall off his broom. Mr. Weasley changes the subject by pulling out his watch and asking if they're waiting for anyone else because it's almost time. Yeah, that's not how it happened in the movie. Not even remotely. Not even kind of. <laughs> not even like a little bit. <laughs> After Mr. Weasley introduces the Diggories, they just keep walking, and as Harry walks past Mr. Diggory, he recognizes Harry as Harry Potter and shakes his hand enthusiastically, telling him that it's a great pleasure. And that was it. That was was totally it. Which, I mean, I kind of like it a little bit better the way they did it in the movie, because I kind of hate Amos Diggory in the book. (laughs) Like, you're kind of like, why are you bringing this up? Why are you being a dick right now, guy? Like, I mean, he's only being a dick to Harry. He's proud of his son. I know he's just being a dick to Harry, but it's Harry. I'm going to be protective. <laughs> Don't be a dick to Harry. He like he could have died after falling off his broom, and you're just like going to sit there and gloat because you your son lying. didn't? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. Don't be a dick. Yeah, Mr. Diggory in the movie was definitely more likable, and I'm sure we'll end up talking more about this later on. It's just kind of annoying that it was inaccurate. Yeah. Like, they just completely changed his character. I agree. But since nobody else is joining them, Mr. Weasley tells them to get ready. They just need to touch the port key. And the nine of them crowd around the old boot that Mr. Diggory is holding. In the movie, they have to continue their trek because Mr. Diggory did not already have the boot like in the book. The sun is finally starting to rise and they make their way up a grassy hill where they find a lone boot perched at the top. It was a very cinematic presentation of the manky old boots Mm -hmm. with the zoom in and the sun rising in the background. It looked very beautiful. It was beautiful. Sure. Beautiful manky old boot. Beautiful, disgusting ass boot. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Since the movie didn't have any of the exposition about port keys between Harry and Mr. Weasley, like in the book, all we get is Harry asking why everyone is standing around that manky old boot and Fred and George explaining that it's a port key. Harry asks what a port key is, and no one bothers to answer him, because why would you do that? Why? Why would you help out the person who's never seen a port key before? That's just silly. (laughs) I mean, they're way too busy with their manky old boot. I mean, exactly. Everyone is down on their hands and their knees, getting busy with the boot. Wait, no. (laughs) Not that. Uh, They all just have a hand on the boot. I touch the boot. That's not helping, Ellen. (laughs) (sighs) Everyone is touching the port key, except for Harry, who is... Still extremely bewildered by the situation. And I love how he's choosing now to question it. Like, literally everyone, even Hermione, is touching the boot. But he's like, wait, what? (laughs) But as Mr. Diggory counts to three, Arthur realizes that Harry still isn't touching the boot and calls his name. Harry manages to get his hand on it just in time. Well, that's not how it happened in the book, since Harry got to ask Mr. Weasley all about port keys on their walk. Though... They do all gather around and touch the boot. As they wait, Harry wonders how odd they would look if a muggle walked by. And a super minor difference here is that it's Mr. Weasley counting in the book, and he begins counting down from three, not like how the movie had Mr. Diggory start at one. Oh my god, how dare they? Movie ruined, fuck this. Damn you, Mike Newell. Ah, Newell! (laughs) (laughs) But then as soon as he reaches one, Harry feels like he's been hooked behind his navel and is lifted off the ground, speeding forward and banging into the people next to him, their fingers magically stuck to the boot. The next moment, Harry slams into the ground and Ron falls into him. 
I actually liked how the movie did the port key, though. It wasn't quite how I imagined it from the description in the book, but I still liked it. We get that aerial view as the group begins to spiral before being lifted into the air. Yeah, I liked it too, though it did last longer than I imagined it would have. I expected it to be more of a disappear, reappear type thing, but the movie showed us the more abstracted actual traveling through some kind of wormhole. I like it better than just disappear, reappear. Like it added more drama. Yeah. I guess. The movies do that from time to time. Occasionally. When they feel like it. (laughs) (laughs) Then the camera focuses on their faces midair, and Mr. Weasley tells them to let go. Hermione says, what? But they all let go, because, sure. (laughs) I don't understand why we're touching a boot, but I'll do it. I don't understand why we're letting go of the boot, but I'll do it. Right. The Weasleys have not killed Harry yet, so sure. I mean... But they all let go and fall through that wormhole thing. And like in the book, Harry, Ron, Hermione, Ginny, and the Weasley twins hit the ground hard. Hard. (laughs) Hard. (laughs) They look up and see Mr. Weasley, Mr. Diggory, and Cedric walking through the air and lightly landing on their feet. I want to know how Cedric knows how to land properly with the walkie floaty thing. I imagine that he's just used a port key before. He is a little bit older than the twins. Yeah. And we know that the Weasleys tend to travel by flu powder. So maybe that's the first time they've really used one too. Maybe. In the book, when Harry looks up, he sees Mr. Weasley, Mr. Diggory, and Cedric all standing while everyone else is on the ground. They hear a voice say seven past five from Stoat's Head Hill. The movie section ends on Mr. Diggory saying that he bets that cleared their sinuses. Yeah. Yeah. Dad joke. <laughs> It probably did, though. I mean, yeah. Sure. But now we're at the end of our compare and contrast section. And since we actually had movie scenes, we can talk about the new and returning actors. Huzzah! We're going to start with Daniel Radcliffe returning as Harry Potter since the scene opened on his fitful sleep and awful hair. Terrible hair. That's not his fault. It's not. It's not. It's not his fault. We are but... fully blaming Mike Newell for this one. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever was and the, the hair oh, so... and makeup person. Oh. However, we are not talking about hair. We are talking about Harry. Exactly. As played by Daniel Radcliffe. Yes. And he was wonderful as always. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't have a ton to do just yet yeah. in this scene. And I'm sure we'll end up talking about things that he does throughout the whole movie because it's kind of about him. He'll have a few other moments. A couple here and there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he's... First impression aside from the hair. Once you get past the hair... If you get past the hair. If you get past... Yeah. It's a big if. But once you get past it, he does very well. It is kind of how I imagined his hair in the seventh book, though, which it wasn't like that. Really? Yeah, because they never cut their hair the whole time. Yeah, that's true. So. That is true. But Daniel Radcliffe himself, we have to get off of his hair. It was not his fault. Daniel Radcliffe himself was a fantastic Harry Potter. Mm Mm-hmm. As always. And he's great. You can see how he's growing so much. Yeah. Not even just like literally. Physically. Yeah. But like as an actor. Like, when you compare how he used to act when his scar was hurting in Philosopher slash Sorcerer's Stone versus how he is... It was more in subtle. The beginning of this. Yeah, it was much more subtle. Believable, it even. It wasn't just completely, like, scrunch face. Must scrunch face. <laughs> like, it was actually acting. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, he's definitely growing up. It's nice yeah. to see. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, we saw Emma Watson as Hermione Granger, and I am... Again, sorry that I'm so harsh on her. It's not even necessarily that I'm hating on Emma. It's the character. It's entirely the character. Because I think that Emma played the character very well. I just don't like Hermione. It's something that we were talking about with Sarah as well. About Mm -hmm. when she rewrote the first story from Hermione's perspective. Like, why does Hermione talk so much? She gave her an anxiety issue. Yeah. And... Hermione in the movie is just a bitch and a bossy know-it-all. Yeah. And I don't think that's what she was in the book. But I also think that's how they directed her. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think they directed Emma to be that bossy Mm know-it-all. And it didn't always translate very well or make her a sympathetic character when she was. It didn't. Like I said, I love her come, you know, the seventh and eighth movies, you know, right in time for them to be over. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's just, she just comes off as just such a bitch. 
I think she has some really wonderful moments throughout all of them. Yeah. And it just, we watch her grow up with the role as well. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, you can see Hermione in her. You know what I mean? Like, she's very synonymous with Hermione. But speaking of hair, but hers was way too pretty. It was just sleek and shiny. There was not a single bit of bush to it. Yeah. As usual. I mean, we had this same issue in the last movie. The first two movies, she was like quasi Hermione hair. And now we're just basically going to. We just gave up. Yeah. They're just like, we're just going to make you look pretty as you can. (laughs) Like Hollywood. Yeah. Next up, we have Rupert Grint as Ron Weasley, who also has bad hair. Terrible hair. But as much as I don't like his reaction to Hermione's appearance in his bedroom, I do love how he did it. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't want that to be the reaction, but I loved how Rupert Grint played it. Yeah. He's so fucking funny. Well, I mean, because you know more than likely that wasn't his idea. Like, that was scripted. Yeah, probably. And he played it the best way he could for what was written. You know what I mean? He has a real talent for physical comedy. Mm -hmm. And I love that Bloody Hell is just like his catchphrase. Yeah. (laughs) I still want to do like, I still want to find or make my own montage of him saying Bloody Hell. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) All of his Bloody Hells. Yeah. Bad hair. Did a great job as Ron Weasley. Bad hair, but wonderful acting. Yep. We love him. We also got to see Mark Williams as Mr. Weasley. Aww. No Molly, but you know what? At least we got Mr. Weasley. At least we did get Mr. Weasley. Because I do. I love Mark Williams. I love it. He makes such a perfect Mr. Weasley. Like, it's mm-hmm. just exactly how I imagined him. Right? He's adorable. He makes me happy. <laughs> just... <laughs> he does. I think he does a good job balancing the, like, he's like the mullet of parents. He's the mullet of parents. <laughs> he's business in the front and party in the back. I think he's kind of party in front. He's, yeah. He's like a reverse mullet. He's <laughs> He portrays himself as awesome and every now and then is stern. Isn't that a bowl cut? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really long bangs. <laughs> the undercut. That's it. <laughs> the under. It's an undercut. <laughs> Whatever he is, he's wonderful. He is wonderful. You know, I'll take it. <laughs> we also had James Phelps as Fred Weasley. And Oliver Phelps as George Weasley. Which I still feel bad that we like lump them together because they are two totally different people. But they're different people. But let's be honest, they played the same character. Like half of their lines were delivered together. Yeah. Like I feel bad, but that doesn't mean we're going to change the way we're doing I love those two. (laughs) I am so unbelievably pissed that we did not get to see their oh tongue tongue toffees and the way they reacted with that and their fight with Mrs. Weasley over them. Uh, could you just imagine the visual of seeing her axio all of the yeah. toffees from their clothes and their <laughs> outrage from it? Like the twin tandem talk over that? It'd be so brilliant and we didn't right? get it and I'm really mad. <laughs> yeah? Mm-hmm. You okay? No. <laughs> Sorry. I will be. Just move on. Okay. Unless you have anything you want to say about them. Deep (laughs) breaths. I mean, you pretty much summed it up for me. (laughs) That was pretty much exactly how I was feeling. Maybe a little (laughs) more chill. Just go with ditto on the calm end. (laughs) (laughs) To calm you down, we're going to go ahead and mention Bonnie Wright as Ginny Weasley. You think that's going to calm me down? No. (laughs) But it'll get you off the topic of the twins. Not because it's Bonnie Wright. I actually love Bonnie Wright. Mm-hmm. I think she makes an adorable Ginny. We don't like how they wrote her. They, oh, God. She was such a badass in the books. I know. She could have been awesome. All she got was a little flirty smirk. Mm-hmm. That's all she got. Yeah. There were so many opportunities. And they were just like, nope. <laughs> you get nothing. You're just the background little sister eventual love interest. Mm-hmm. That is all. <laughs> very one-dimensional but bonnie wright did a great job with every little bit that she did and she actually had decent hair so. yeah she had great <laughs> hair she had perfect jenny weasley hair right she really is like exactly how i picture yeah Ginny. like yeah she looked the part and i think she's a great actress i think that they just wrote jenny wrong mm-hmm. so and like i said she didn't have much to do in this part either so we'll talk more about yeah. Her role as she has it. Yeah. And such. We also had a couple of new actors to the film that we met in this section. We had Jeff Rawl as Amos Diggory. Looking like an Oliver Twist reject. Looking like an <laughs> Oliver Twist reject. 
But you know what? I know we talked about this earlier and how he was much more unlikable in the book. Mm -hmm. But I liked that I liked him. Yeah. Oh, no. In the movie. You know what I mean? Um, I think he played that really well. But I also think he could have nailed the unlikable. I think he could have, too. Yeah. I will say, though, that later on, and we'll talk more about this then, he has a scene that just breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. Every time. I think it was the first time I ever cried during the movies. Yeah. And I don't know that it would have affected us as much had he been an asshole. That's, yeah. So. That's what I kind of keep going back to. I wouldn't have felt the way I felt, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. But. (laughs) I get um, it. Had he been the jerk that he was supposed to be from the book. Yeah. I agree. You know. And lastly, Robert Pattinson as Edward Cullen. Oh, uh, (laughs) I mean, Cedric Diggory, of course. A vampire. (laughs) Holy shit, a vampire. I think it's disappointing that we didn't get to meet him earlier on. Mm -hmm. Considering everything that happens with him later on, I think it's a shame that we didn't get to know him better. Yeah. So. Yeah. But I thought that he played the role of Cedric that they gave him very well. I think that he's developing into a super talented actor the older that he gets. Oh, yeah. It's been actually amazing watching where he, he started to what he's doing now. He surprises me. Yeah. Like, he surprises me every role where I'm like, really? He got cast? As, like, when he got like, cast wait, as Batman? Batman? Yeah. I was like, but really, though? But Batman? And then I saw previews and I was like, oh, oh. no. He can get it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm actually really looking forward to that. DC has kind of been disappointing me with their movies. Facts. But this one has a very noir feel to it. Yeah. And that has a lot of potential. So yeah. I'm hopeful that it'll be good. Mm-hmm. Fingers are crossed. Definitely. Fingers crossed. I think um, that Robert Pattinson will be good in it because I do think he's a good actor. Yeah. So I think he made a great Cedric Diggory. He did. Well, let's just keep rolling right into our Potter pondering, which is... Do you think you would prefer to travel by broom, flu powder, a port key, or apparition, and why? Or feel free to suggest anything else, like right. We've got our patrons on Discord right now, and Carly suggested a flying carpet. So, oh, there you go. Perhaps someone's favorite horsey bird. So, yeah. Any other thoughts you have? Find our Facebook page and share them with us. Mm-hmm. We really look forward to reading them. This will bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Marissa the Ravenclaw. She writes. Hi, my name is Marissa, and I'm a Ravenclaw. I think the colors should be blue and bronze and an eagle. My wand is cherry blossom wood, 10 inches long, and unicorn hair. My Patronus is a dolphin, and I love your podcast. Aw, yay. I started Harry Potter by hearing the words Harry Potter at a summer camp when I was nine. When I got home from the summer camp, I asked my mom what Harry Potter was, and she read me the first book chapter by chapter before I went to bed. Now I have a bookcase full of my Harry Potter collection. Thank you so much for sharing your Sorting Hat story, Marissa. Mm -hmm. We're so glad that you've been enjoying the podcast. And we totally agree with you about the Ravenclaw colors and mascot. Definitely. I don't know if you had a chance to check out our website, but I've designed some house-themed swag. And the Ravenclaw stuff is absolutely blue and bronze with an eagle. Definitely. Yes. As it should be. Yep. (laughs) Yep. And we also agree that everyone should have a bookcase full of Harry Potter. Or two. Or two, yeah. Or, or a three. Room. Or, or yes. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for sharing your story. If any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else that you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. True. And that'll bring us to this week's trivia question, which is, why doesn't Perkins use his tent so much anymore? The prize for the first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word, hashtag bigger on the inside, will get a sticker. Like we said before, we aren't going to post a separate trivia post for it, so just look for an episode post, which Podbean will post to Facebook right at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, And respond with the answer and code word there. And feel free to post any other questions and comments about the episode there as well. We love hearing from our keepers. Mm -hmm. Also, another way you can get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes. If you don't have an Apple account, then you can write us a recommendation on our Facebook page. 
Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at justkeeprolling.com to check out our Just Keep Rolling and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you'd like to support us as a patron, you can sign up on patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. $2 $2 and up a month will get you some awesome perks, like Just Keep Rolling swag, access to patron-only Facebook groups, chats, our Discord channel, virtual hangouts, and more. We actually have a Zoom Harry Potter game night planned with our Order of Merlin first through fourth class patrons right after this, and we're so excited. So excited. Maybe you can join us for the next one. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about Chapter 7. Bagman and Crouch, and the somewhat corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just just keep keep rolling. rolling.